In this video, I'm going to upgrade this Crazy Cart XL to be a total sleeper and have 7 times the stock power. But before I do that, I want to ride the stock cart, but these batteries are totally dead. All I need is a new 36 volt battery, luckily for me I have a 36 volt e-bike battery that I can just slap on there and plug the wires into. You could do this as a more permanent solution if you took the battery and put it in here sideways if you moved the controller over and got rid of this little bracket, but this is just temporary. I went and rode the stock cart around. It's pretty fun, you can pull the e-brake and do some big drifts, but you know me, I got the need for speed so it's time to start upgrading. Actually, before I do that, I should probably show you how this works since some of you may not know. The only powered wheel on this whole thing is the front wheel which is under this front cover. The steering allows it to turn more than 360 degrees. Combined with the rear caster wheels that activate when you pull the lever, this allows you to do some super wide drifts, just like this was a front wheel drive car with trays under the rear wheels. A lot of people like to upgrade these by going to 48 volts and a larger brush motor, but I'm just going to skip straight to the point and go to 72 volts and a brushless motor. I'm going to start by upgrading this tire. This little solid tire isn't going to have enough grip for the power this thing's going to have, so I'm going to use an E300 tire that's a bit bigger. These dropouts need to be widened a bit, but that doesn't look too hard. Since this new tire is a larger diameter than the old tire, it'll make the cart sit higher in the front, but I think it'll be fine. I went ahead and cut the dropouts to make the tire fit, and then I put the axle in, but this is when I realized that this tire's bearings are a larger diameter. I grabbed the E300 axle to compare, and sure enough, it has a larger diameter in the middle. Luckily, I have this perfect tube piece that I can grind down and use as a spacer between the wheel bearings and the axle. And just like that, the wheel was good to go. Now it's time to look at the motor. I'm going to be using this slightly shorter 1000 watt 36 volt MY1020. The first thing I want to do is take it all apart so I can drill these screw holes to make them flush with the back plate, and I can drill all the cooling holes to make them larger. I'll also have to relocate this sprocket. Here's the front and back plates with the larger cooling holes and the recessed screw holes. Now that the motor is as compact and high performance as possible, it's time to install it. However, it's still too long. I gotta cut this shaft down. After I cut the shaft down and welded the sprocket on, it was good to go. I bolted it down on top of two layers of washers to make sure it had some chain adjustability each way. Even with me putting the sprocket as close to the motor as possible, it still wasn't close enough. So to get the chain to line up, I had to put the stock sprocket in between the hub and the new sprocket. At this point, I also welded the freewheel so I could enable region, which the stock cart definitely needed. Once I installed that whole assembly back into the cart, it was time to focus on the battery. Once I removed this stock bracket, it gave me a huge area to work with. I'm going to be building a 72 volt 30 amp hour battery for this cart, which is just ridiculous. It'll be 5 times the stock capacity, so it should last forever even with the higher power. The cells I'm going to be using are these back 21700 cells that are 5 amp hours of capacity and 10 amps of discharge. When I unbox them, they're all jumbled up like this, but they weren't damaged so I can't really complain since I did get them for only $1 a cell, which is just so cheap. I'm also going to be using hexagon cell spacers like I always do, and this dumb 50 amp BMS from my first Razor scooter. Before I put all the cells into the spacers, I made sure to test each one's voltage and internal resistance to make sure they're all good. Once I put all the cells in the spacers, I put the BMS on the side and started thinking about how the current was going to flow. I'm going to have it come down one side, go across the bus bar, and then go back on the other side. That way, all the main current connections will be on the same side of the pack, which will make the wiring super easy. Here's what my cell connections look like. I only need 0.15mm nickel since these aren't high current cells. However, on the bottom row, I'm going to have to do a copper nickel sandwich for the bus bar. I made sure to add some fish paper so these cells don't short out. Time to get to spot welding. After I got all that spot welding done, it was time to connect the BMS. I decided to do a little copper piece like that, and then another copper piece here so I could put the BMS on top like this and then solder it on. I think this would be the perfect way to do it, because I only have that little solder joint there, but I can't get these cells to do a copper nickel sandwich anymore. I think it's gotten a little cooler since I did the bottom, so I'm just going to add some nickel going up to a big piece of copper on the top. 
Here's how it turned out. I went ahead and did the other side too, so I could do all my spot welding at the same time. Now on the BMS side, I got six pieces of nickel going up to a piece of copper on the bottom that soldered to that copper that goes over the top. It's kind of hard to explain in words, but you see what I mean. That'll just sit right here on top, and I can bend the nickel over and spot weld it to the cells. The copper I spot welded on the bottom of the pack is only 0.15 millimeter, while this copper up here is 0.5 millimeter, so it's a lot thicker, so I don't need to use nearly as wide of a piece to carry the same current. Anyways, it's time for the balance wires. I'm going to have to extend them a bit since they were used. Here's how they turned out. I thought they were going to be a bit harder to do, but they turned out to be pretty easy. Since this isn't a smart BMS, I can't just connect my phone to it to check everything like I normally do, so I'm going to grab a charger and some alligator clips and try and charge the pack. Once I connected the charger, it seemed to work, but there's no lights on the BMS, so I don't know if it's actually working. So I left one of the bounce leads long, so I could cut it and see if the charger cuts off. And sure enough, it does. This is really good, it means the BMS knew something was wrong and cut off the charger. Now that I'm more confident in the BMS, I can fish paper, capped on tape, and shrink wrap the whole pack. After that, I hot glued all the seams to make it more water resistant and soldered on two XT60 connectors, since this isn't a super high current pack. Now it's time to sit back and admire my work. I really like this new black shrink wrap I got. None of the seams ripped like they sometimes did with the old blue shrink wrap I had. To test the pack, I put it in my Ego Mini Bike. I started off on Mode 1, which is 50 amps, and it worked perfectly. I then put it on Mode 2, 100 amps, and I expected it to trip pretty quick, but it just wasn't tripping. So I went all out and put it on Mode 3, 200 amps, and it was still not tripping. I was pulling 180 amps through this 50 amp BMS for like 10 seconds doing pulls, which is not good. This is why I'm never using these dumb BMSs again, you just have no idea what type of quality you're getting. Luckily for me, the stock crazy cart had two 30 amp fuses, which I can put in parallel to serve as the overcurrent protection for this pack. It's not as good as electronic overcurrent protection, but it's better than nothing. Now it's time to start installing the electronics in the cart. I got the battery in there, it fits pretty good, I'll just have to add some foam around it to hold it still. I got the little fuse module, I had to bend it to fit it there. I'm definitely going to have to cut a bunch of holes in this side panel here to get all the wires in. I think the motor wires will fit through that hole and then I'll drill another hole over here to connect it up to the motor. The motor wires have to be extended a ton because I had to leave a bunch of slack for the steering mechanism. For all the signal wires that plug into the harness, I'm going to have to extend them with this thin wire, I'm pretty sure I have all the right colors. To charge the battery, I'll take the extra XT60 plug and I'll plug it into an XT60 extension that uses this panel mount XT60. I don't really know where all this is going yet, but I'll figure it out. I should be able to use the stock power switch, which will be pretty convenient. It's got three connections in the back, so I'll have to use my multimeter to troubleshoot which is which, and I'll see if I can add a resistor so it doesn't burn out the light at 72 volts. Next I have the voltmeter, which I'll install upside down so that when you're sitting in the seat it's easier to read. After that, I'll add a 3-speed switch and wire in the stock throttle. I also decided that I'm going to add a brake pedal, however this isn't really a brake pedal, it's more of a regen button, since it's just on and off. The first thing I want to do is mount up the controller. I'm going to be using this 50 amp far driver controller. I decided to just bolt it on here since there's no way I can fit it in the battery compartment. However, if I just bolt it on here, there's going to be no airflow to the heatsink, so it might overheat. So instead, I'm going to flip the crazy cart over and use some chalk to make an outline of the controller, so I can cut a perfect hole to match the controller. With the controller like that, the heatsink can get cool on the bottom with all the connections sticking through the top. The last thing to do before wiring is mounting this foot pedal switch. All it is is a micro switch inside, I think this came with my K-Weld when I bought it. A few holes drilled and bolts threaded later and it's done. To route the wires, I just copied the exact same route that the gas pedal took. Once the wires go up, they meet the motor cables and head into the battery box. The motor cables are soldered to some copper pieces then bolted to the controller because I didn't have any lugs that small. I did the same thing with the battery cables. 
for this last bit of wiring, I put the whole thing up on my workbench so I didn't kill my back bending over. As you can see, the far driver harness was long enough to get wired straight up to the ignition switch. I even managed to find the right resistor to have the ignition switch light work. I'll cover that with hot glue later so it doesn't wiggle loose. Same thing with the three speed switch. The voltmeter was the farthest away, but luckily for me it came with wires already attached so I didn't have to extend anything. After that, I put the battery in with a bunch of foam stopping it from moving around. It doesn't look the best, but this is super easy to change, so I think it's fine. Finally, I took it on its first test ride, which went great for the first 10 minutes until the controller gave me the Hall Effect sensor error. At first I suspected the throttle pedal might use a 3.3 volt Hall Effect sensor instead of a 5 volt one and I fried it, but it turns out it was in the motor. The 5 volt line was shorted to ground somewhere, so I cut the power to the first sensor and it was still shorted. I cut the power to the second sensor, it was still shorted, and when I cut the power to the third sensor, suddenly it wasn't shorted. So I knew it was the third sensor that fried. I went ahead and replaced all three sensors to be safe, and then fixed the throttle and it was good to go. Now before I really start riding this hard, I'm going to test the overcharge protection by setting my charger to 90 volts. If the BMS is working right, it'll stop charging before it goes over 84 volts. After setting the charger, I just sat here and watched it to make sure it didn't actually charge at 90 volts and blow up, but it looks like it cut out because it shot right up to 90 volts. When I unplug the charger, it goes back to 83 volts, so I know the overcharge protection is working. This test also proves that the MOSFETs didn't fail on, which could have happened when I was pulling a ton of current earlier. Anyways, enough with all that safety stuff, it's time to get dangerous and see what this cart can really do. When you're driving fast enough, you don't even need the lever to drift. If you do use the lever while going fast, it's super easy to spin out. I took it to the testing area and brought my brother, his friend, and some boxes so we could make a course to try drifting around. One thing I noticed right away is that when you're driving fast you have to hold the wheel tight otherwise it does a huge death wobble. I don't know why it does this, it might be the bigger wheel or the extra torque, but it's annoying. After riding it for a bit, I can see why people usually don't crank the power up on these things, it really doesn't even help you drift. Here my brother has it set to 50% power and it's already way too much power to the point where the throttle is just way too touchy.
well, I got all this power, I might as well use it somehow. That's enough crazy carding for me, I'm just gonna sell it now, but I need the 50 amp controller off it for my next project, so I'm gonna steal the 35 amp controller off my rental scooter. I'm parting out the scooter because the rear tire started to break apart when I was riding it, which may have something to do with all the huge burnouts we were doing. I took a slow-mo video and it's literally starting to fly off the rim, so it's pretty dangerous. I'm also worried that the frame's gonna break in half because I had to chop a huge chunk out of it to fit the battery in there, plus the brakes have never really been good, so I think it's a lost cause. I had to see what riding on the bare motor would feel like, and it doesn't feel very good. I don't know what I'm gonna do with this battery, it's such a weird shape with the BMS hanging out the front. I decided I can cut the shrink wrap and fold it together, but it's still kind of a weird shape. I guess I'll just keep it around as a test battery, eventually I'll probably want the BMS out of it. Here's what the 35 amp controller looks like on the crazy cart. It fits a lot better because I really cut that hole to fit this controller because I knew I would be swapping it. The only thing left to do before selling it is changing out this tire because it's super worn for some weird reason. My two options are the tires from my first Razor scooter, which are the E300 size, but they're the newer size, so they're even bigger than the old E300 size that's on the crazy cart now. So I'll go ahead and put the old one on, because I don't need it squatting anymore. Now it's ready to go to its new home. With that black controller, it's even more of a sleeper, since it stands out a lot less. I see how these can be fun, but I prefer my drift carts a bit different. That's it for this video, thanks for watching!